Praise the Lord. <laughs> I am ready for summer. I want summer. I'm ready. Matter of fact, some of my plants are ready. If we get away from the trash man and take the trash out. Of course, I think the trash man ought to take some of our trash out. Because sometimes we've got trash all strung about our life. Sometimes you've let the trash build up in your life and you haven't taken it out and let the trash man haul it away. Sometimes you've kind of like let it stink up your life where you can smell something but you don't know where it's coming from. It's the trash. Take the trash out. Get rid of it. Get it out of your life. Give it to God. Let it go. Get done with it. Preparing for summer, I love it because I'll dig out my hats and my short sleeve shirts, you know, and my clothes, you know, and it's kind of nice, you know, it's kind of like, you know it's coming, you know, you know it's going to get here, you know it'll be here, you know, you know it's going to happen. And so you get ready for it because you're all excited and you're going like, yeah, cool, it's going to be warm, it's going to be sunny, so you get the shades out, you know, you start thinking and acting and behaving a different way. Some of you plan vacations, some of you plan to go do things. Some of you will be here, you know, just like me, and sharing the Word of God. Although I do take, I take a couple weeks off to go camping. <laughs> Actually, when I take off, I go to with my wife to a place where there's no cell phone reception, no technology, no anything. And we just crash. You could say we detox from the world, but <laughs> that might be getting carried away and somebody might take me serious. But the point is, is that you get ready for it. Now, there are people that tell me, you know, oh, you know, just like I, I read today, you know, I, I was on the internet, you know, and I saw, oh no, another new video that came out about how the end of the world is coming to the East Coast this year in 2012. There's going to be a giant tsunami that wipes out the entire East Coast seaboard and that everyone should leave their cities and leave the sides of the ocean front, you know, and just get away up to high country. Right. You buy that? <laughs> That's one of the dumbest things I've heard. As a matter of fact, I hear some pretty dumb things come over the internet, don't you? Some pretty wacko stuff. And you know, your first reaction is, well, that's dumb. But then you read it, you know, and you kind of think about it for a minute, and you kind of ponder it. Well, don't. When it's that dumb, don't bother. When it's that silly, don't get involved. You see, Jesus had an interesting statement. In Matthew chapter 24, or on the Sermon on the Mount, basically, forget 24, but in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus was talking to the crowds, he said, look, these things are going to happen. If you do these things, you'll be ready for them. If you don't do these things, you won't be ready for them. If you want to have your house established, you know, and you want to kind of know that you know everything's going to be all right, well then, do what I tell you. And so he said, look, Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those, blessed is this, blessed is that. But he said, look, your father takes care of you. He's going to take care of you. You know, one way or another, either you're going to live through that experience, and God will provide because he takes care of the birds and the lilies of the field and all those things. And you've seen it. You've gone through, if you're old enough, some disaster in your life that you didn't think you were going to make it through. <gasps> oh, no, it's the end of the world. Oh, no. And meanwhile, the old timers are going, yep. Been there, done that, you'll get over it. <laughs> and they don't want to take an attitude of like, huh, told you so. But in reality, the Bible told you so. Because frankly, that's what Jesus meant by being prepared for these things that are coming upon the world. It's going to happen. If you planned out your you know, life, then you're not worried about if your house gets destroyed by a tornado or it gets knocked down by a hurricane or it gets flooded by a tsunami. You're alive. And if you aren't alive, then you're not listening to this video. <laughs> or are you? <laughs> but the point is, you should have prepared for your death as much as you prepare for your life. You should prepare for disasters as much as you pre prepare for summer. You know you prepare for summer. When you decide to go camping, don't you make sure that you've got all your tent stakes, your tent, 
your sleeping bag, you know, all the stuff that you need to go camping. Or maybe you don't. <laughs> maybe you just wing it out there, you know, and you're kind of like, well, you know, we're going to go pay for a motel room. <laughs> okay, <laughs> if you say so. But And you jump into motorhome and you go without gas. No, of course not. You look at what you need and you plan for it accordingly. The same thing is true about what God wanted us to do all of our lives. He wanted us to walk with him, to talk with him, to read what he had to say, to do what he told us to do, and then also to personally apply it as we talk to him daily. So, some things are God sense. You know, I use that word a lot, God sense, because common sense has gone out the window. People don't have any common sense anymore. I mean, my mother used to say, you know, you have the lick of sense that someone was born with, and I can't even remember what the expression is. It shows you how much common sense I had. But the practical realities of dealing with just normal practical stuff, for some reason, people have gotten to where they just think that, you know, oh, well, I'll faith it, wing it, or pray it. Pray it. No. God said there are certain principles and certain things that are facts in your life that he says, don't do this or this will happen. Or he says, do this so that when it happens, you can handle it. That's the point. If you didn't do what he said to do, your house will get torn down. Bottom line. That's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. If you do these sayings of mine, I will liken you to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. When the storms of life came and the floods came and all these things came to you know, his house, it stood upon a rock and it was sound. Because the house that he's talking about isn't just you know, the physical being of the building that you occupy because you know as well as I do, this is all going to burn. I mean, come on, let's get real. We're in the last generation. It's going to pass away. But the house also is your life. It's the way you live. It's where you occupy most of your time, which is you. You're mostly occupied with you, aren't you? <laughs> I hope so, because if you're occupied in someone else, I think that's a little weird. <laughs> vicarious living is not vicariously done. Unfortunately, that's called existential realities that don't exist, and it's just a fantasy. But you know you. You live, breathe, have your being, you know, you, you occupy this flesh you live in, you know, and you make your life comfortable as much as you can, and you enjoy it for what it is. You do the things that you want to do when you do it, when you want to do it. And sometimes some things force you into doing things like getting a job or paying for the rent or doing, you know, those utility things that you need to do, whichever part of the world you live in. But likewise, Jesus said, I have something for you if you want to be part of my kingdom not part of the world system. You need to seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, all the things that you think you need from the world system, because I'll provide it, because the world system at times will collapse. It will fall apart. There are times where some little disaster will come along, and you might be without power, say, for 24 hours. <gasps> oh, no, I don't have TV. <laughs> for some of you, that's a big crisis. Oh, no, I don't have air conditioning. That could be a crisis, depending upon where you live in the world. But you might go without power for a day, a week, a month, maybe. Or if you're in Alaska, you better get power quick. <laughs> we knew that, so we had to fix it ourselves lots of times. But you see, God, literally, in the form of Jesus, was telling us to prepare for that. It will happen. Those kinds of things are normal. It's not like it's some kind of sign or wonder. No, it's a normal occurrence. It's going to happen in your life. So living your life as a Christian means you prepare for those things. You understand where you live. If you built your house, no offense, upon sand, you kind of know that that foundation's a little shaky. It might look good on the beach. You know, you might be looking out there over the waves, you know, and say, oh, it's wonderful. But if you built it below sea level, don't tell me when you get flooded that, you know, it was like, oh my God, you know, I didn't see it coming. Yes, you did. You just push the odds anyways, and you know it. Or if you tell me you live in a tornado belt, you know, and you don't have tornado-proof housing or tornado insurance, guess what? You did it. You know better. You were told. It's obvious. Or you live in a floodplain. And it floods every five to ten years, or floods every year, like the Mississippi. Don't tell me it's something weird and unusual. You did it. You know it. You bought it. You lived it. You went through it, and you lost it, didn't you? So don't let your faith be wrapped up in the circumstances of what you didn't prepare for. Prepare for it. Get ready. Because that's what Jesus said. 
get ready because he's coming back. It's not just getting ready for leaving this world behind, but it's get ready with your life. Get ready with every day that you live. Get ready with the things that you're doing. You will suffer the consequences of your actions. You reap what you sow. Everything that Jesus taught was straight up practical, straight confrontation. Directly confronting you in your lifestyle and saying, look, this is the fact. Now what are you going to do about it? It's your choice. You, know, you get to choose, but here's what happens when you don't choose or you do choose. And that's what he said. His teachings were very simple. They were very direct and everybody understood them. Nowadays, people want to spiritualize it and make it into some kind of like hunky-dory, let's all get blessed and have our money and fun and cake and eat it too. I'm sorry, but my ice cream doesn't come that way. You know, It's put in the freezer and my cake is baked in an oven. They are two separate entities. I like them both, but I get them from two different places. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that they get one-stop shopping by getting saved once and then they ignore God for the rest of their life. Doesn't work that way. We call it the Word of God for a reason. There are instructions in it. There are methodologies. There are things that God wants to apply. And as he applies them, he, not we, not me, not you, not them, not her, not she, not they. It's me applying for myself by way of praying and asking God to lead me in the Word of God. Now, as I read it and it applies to my life, I see how it fits. And I say, hey, you know what? I like having a hammer and nail because you know what? I can take the hammer and I can take the nail and I can put it into some wood and I can begin to construct things. I can assemble things. I can put it together and it fits. Now, I may not be the perfect framer. <laughs> you thought I didn't know what framing is. Yeah, I know what framing is. I've done some framing work. I may not be the perfect drywaller. I've done drywall. I may not be the perfect roofer. I've done roofing. I may not be the perfect plumber. I've done some plumbing. You know, I may not be the perfect electrician. I've done some electrician work in Alaska. I've done a lot of maintenance work and I've done a lot of building. I've even helped a guy build a log cabin once. But the point is, is that you don't have to be perfect in the construction of your life. You have to be obedient in the construction and preparation of your life. Every day you will face challenges. Every day you will face problems. According to James, every day you are supposed to be able to count it joy because you're learning from it and if you wait long enough, patiently, God will show you something through it. He'll demonstrate how He wants you to do it. Because more than likely, if you're like me, you probably went out and did it on your own. <laughs> and you know how that shack turned out. As soon as the wind came, it knocked it down because you weren't using six penny nails. You were using some kind of little tackers. Anyways, long story short, no, of course not. You know, we don't go out and build our own houses. We occupy those that are built for us. But you have to be careful when you're doing things that someone has provided for you that you don't get caught up with what is being done to you by way of putting yourself in jeopardy. When you put yourself in jeopardy to being in debt, being in a house that's not built right, living your life as though someone else is telling you what to do, then you're not being responsible for yourself. You alone are the one that will stand before God. You alone are the one that will every day walk with God and talk to Jesus in a personal way. You alone have the responsibility for your own religion, your own faith, your own baptism, your own direction, your own choices, your own decision-making process as a man or a woman or a child to grow up into the fullness that God wants you to have. If you don't do it, it was your responsibility and it was your fault. Because God said He will take care of you. He will provide for you. He will bring you through all these devastations that come upon the world. Don't get caught up in what people try to make. Oh, it's the end of the world again. No, it's always been the end of the world. We know it's the last generation. That's normal. We know that because Israel became a nation. That's an obvious fact. You're not going to see some things like say you've got little children. Your children will not grow up and have children. Sorry, we're not going to last that long. <laughs> Like to say it would? No, it won't. You know, the end of the road is the end of the road, and it's coming down not too far away, but not this year. And it's not some kind of disastrous thing that you know some tsunami is going to come over and occupy the entire eastern coast, you know, up to the Appalachians, or some massive earthquake is going to cause now the east coast to slide into the ocean. Do you remember when they used to tell California that guess what, the big one's coming and it's going to slide into the ocean? They've been saying that for 40, 50 sorry, 60 years, it ain't happening and I'm right here in California. Now, someday, 
in the tribulation period when you know the world does do some really massive things you know that god said they would do according to scripture yes it will probably be one land mass that gets shoved back together and about that time you could probably say well you know, california didn't really slip into the ocean it kind of slipped back into its place and you know where it was supposed to be in the first place it didn't god split the continents but you know we won't go there and explain it too much because you don't know about tectonic plates and how it's shifting and how it's moving around in the world and how it floats on this level of magma you know and all the stuff about the mantle and the crust and the interrelationship between the center of the earth and the surface of the earth and then the gravitational pulls that are all going on and coexisting and why it causes earthquakes and frictions and mass and the differential between the theoretical sciences of geopolitical or geophysicism. Do you? <laughs> I like to study those things. <laughs> so you see, there's a lot that you could know and you could prepare for and you could enjoy. Like summer coming. You could prepare for it. You could plan for it. You could have a vacation. You could live your life by preparing for it planning for it and enjoying it or you could be miserable and let life hit you right between the eyes and be in a shock it's like people that tell me you know oh my god what am i going to do you know they run up and say you know i can't pay my rent well why not did you plan on it did you purpose within your planning to have a disaster fund for what disasters would come up if not then go enjoy the outdoors i've done it pitched a tent hey you know, if you got to go under a bridge and live there, live there, enjoy it. The point is, God is in where you're at. God is in you, and he is at work with you to accomplish his purposes through you. If you operate according to his purposes, yes, he will bless you, and he will cause some things to come into your life that he wants you to have. But you don't need to be mindful of building a mansion for, you know, 30,000 square foot home so that one person can occupy it and you can pr pretend you're a king of the hill and made yourself into some you know idol you know that you've got to have all these things that are all passing away and are going to be consumed soon or devastated by some natural occurrence that's going to happen to the world but rather you could be the person who in the midst of the storm they're interviewing and saying well why aren't you shook up he says hey you know what I can replace the house I can replace the possessions. I can even replace the dog and the cat. But you know what? I can't replace my salvation. And I thank God that I'm a Christian because God told me ahead of time that I don't have to worry about all these things, but I can seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things would be added again unto me. That's the difference between what a Christian is and a non-Christian. The Christian, you know, I'm not going to say every Christian does this, but I do. The Christian is prepared for disaster and they don't freak. That's their opportunity to shine. When things are darkest, that's when the Christian lights up. So, when you see them facing death, they don't act the same way that non-Christians do. When you see them facing disasters, they don't act the same way. When they go through massive emotional turmoil, like say divorces or changes of jobs or anything, they don't act the same way other people do. They trust in the Lord with all their heart. They lean not in their own understanding. In all their ways they acknowledge Him and He directs their path because they know who they love and they're willing to follow Him even unto death. Fear not, I am the first and the last. You are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, but you are come unto Mount Zion, to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted just like we are. Yet he was without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need and help. Thus saith the Lord God, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? Who is God, save the Lord? And who is a rock, save our God? When you build your house upon a rock, it is upon the foundation of trusting God for your life. Whether you live or whether you die as the three 
young men that were in Daniel's time were told. He says, look, you can throw us in the fire and you can stoke it up even hotter. You could cut off our heads, you could cause us to be elevated, or you could cause us to be debased. But irregardless of what you do to us, we will serve the living God. Because he is who we love. He is who we serve. So they threw him into the fire, and nothing happened. As a matter of fact, Jesus was standing there in the midst of them, one likened unto the Son of God. And good old Neb, you know, Knezer, stood there looking inside and said, Hey, you know what? There's somebody in there. It don't make no sense. You know, let's get real. <laughs> Something's wrong here. <laughs> They're not, like, getting burned up. Oops. Seems something went wrong there. Or did it? So whenever people say you can't trust God, tell them, bite me. <laughs> tell them I said so. Bite me. <laughs> Draw blood. See what happens. <laughs> you get, you know, uh, what is it? Blood, blood born pathogens. There we go. Blood born pathogens. You know, and you'll have to go down and get shots and tested and all that other junk. Just kidding. My blood's fine. But Jesus shed his blood so that we all might find salvation in time of need. We might find mercy and grace in time of desperate methodologies of need that we find ourselves, we put ourselves sometimes even in the place where we should have been prepared and we weren't. That's why we still go back to God, even when we blow it, even when we don't blow it, when we lose it and when we're fine. We go to God to find mercy and grace. Because if you're not living according to his word in mercy, and if you're not enjoying the fullness of his grace, then let me tell you this. All you need to do is ask him to come to you and to live with you. And he will begin to lead you in the way he wants you to go. Just open up a Bible somewhere and talk to him about it. Say, God, I don't know what to do, but you know, maybe if you help me through this, together we could find our way. And I'll follow your way and not my way.